King of Beards. This is my online shop where you can find products that will help you grow a strong, healthy beard. Use my coupon code KING, you'll get 15% off on your first order. All right, starting at number 10, we have the Sunnis. So 85% of the Muslim world are Sunnis, so they make up the majority, clearly. And Sunnis consider themselves to be the guardians of Islamic orthodoxy and tradition based on what the Prophet Muhammad established as well as his four rightly guided caliphs. The sources of the religion and the legal authority are the Quran and the Hadith. And then there's analogy or qiyas and consensus, which is ijma, that's used to resolve certain problems and disputes of matters that may rise that may not be explicitly mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith. And under Sharia, they believe that both individual as well as communal life should be guided by Sharia. The next branch we're looking at is Shia. Shia or the Shiites, they began as a political dispute over the leadership of Islam. And they considered Ali, who was a cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, as the first legitimate successor to the Prophet Muhammad. And that's when we had Shia Ali, which is the party of Ali. And Shiites believe that the revelation ended with the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. However, they also consider there to be a tradition of Imams who are given supernatural powers to interpret the Sharia, the teachings of the Imams are considered infallible by the way. And now Shias are generally synonymous with the term seveners because they believe that there was a series of seven Imams that succeeded the martyrdom of Hussein, which was Ali's youngest son. Shias also have traditionally believed in the existence of a Mahdi, which is sort of like a Messiah figure who will one day appear to restore the purity of all of Islam. Currently, Shias make up the majority in modern Iran, as well as they make up an influential minority in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Pakistan, and Iraq. Branch at number eight are the Karajites. And now the Karajite means those who defected from the group. And now they were members of the earliest sect in Islam that left the followers of Ali, who was a cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. Now the third caliph, Uthman, was killed in the year 656 AD and the struggle for succession followed between Ali and Muawiyah, the governor of Damascus. Now the Karajites left the followers of Ali, who are the Shias, and the Karajites rejected the firstborn succession of the Quraysh, which was a tribe of the Prophet Muhammad, and they assert that the leadership of Islam, which is known as the Caliphate, should be designated by an Imam that's elected by the community from among candidates who possess spiritual and other important personal qualities. Next up, let's talk about the Ibadi. Now this is a school of Islam that's dominant in Oman, and although Ibadism is often described as conservative, it is considered to be a tolerant sect of Islam, which puts a lot of emphasis on the rule of the just, and it rejects violence as a means to political ends. Now, Oman is the only country in the Muslim world that has an Ibadi majority population. Now, the roots of Ibadism go all the way back to the 7th century, 20 years after the Prophet Muhammad's death in 632. One thing to note about Ibadis is that they can trace their origins also back to the Karajites, who came into existence during the first Islamic civil war between 656 and 661. The Karajites, by the way, were the earliest Islamic sect who came about as a result of the religio-political controversy over the Caliphate. But this offshoot of the Karajites, the Ibadi, they believe that the Muslim community can rule itself without a single leader. Ibadis also differ in that they do not agree that a Muslim leader must be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad's tribe. In theology, Ibadis reject a literal interpretation of all human-like descriptions of God, denying even the possibility of seeing God in this life or even in the afterlife. Next up, we have the Sufis. Sufism is an Arabic word called tasawuf, and the word means made of wool, and that refers to the coarse wool garments that were worn by the earlier Muslim mystics as a symbol of poverty and a rejection of worldly pleasures. Sufism is defined as Islamic mysticism, and Sufism is less of a doctrine or belief system than it is an experience and way of life. It is a tradition of enlightenment that carries the essential truth forward throughout time. Now this tradition, however, must be conceived in a vital and dynamic sense. Now its expression must not remain limited to the religious and cultural forms of the past. The truth of Sufism requires reformation and fresh expression in every single age. 
Now, research has shown that only 5% of the total Muslim population in the world follow Sufism. Halfway in at number five, we have the Ahmadiyya. Now, many Muslims protest that they are not even Muslims at all. But for the sake of this video, I included them because they do identify as Islam. Now, the Ahmadi Muslim Jamaat, or the AMJ, is a growing international revival movement within Islam. It was founded back in the year 1889, and the AMJ is the only Islamic organization to believe that the long-awaited Messiah has actually come in the person of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who was born 1835 and lived up until the year 1908, and he was from Kadian, India. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claimed to have been divinely appointed as both the promised Mahdi, the guided one, and the Messiah expected by Muslims to appear towards the end of time. Ahmadis believe that God sent Mirza Gulam Ahmed, like Jesus, to end religious wars, condemn bloodshed, and reinstitute morality, justice, and peace in the world. So with that, followers of Ahmadiyya do not recognize the Prophet Muhammad as the last prophet. The largest concentration of Ahmadiyya Muslims are in West and Eastern Africa, Indonesia, as well as South Asia. Now let's take a look at Wahhabism. Now this is a conservative movement within Islam Sunni branch, and it's named after its founder, theologian, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, who was born in the 18th century in what is now Saudi Arabia. Wahhab advocated a return to a purer form of Islam, focusing on its origins and the absolute sovereignty of God. So that means they reject all the cults of saints, as well as they forbid tobacco, alcohol, and shaving. And their mosques are very plain and simple, as well as their public prayer attendance is heavily enforced. Now the term Wahhabism is often seen as derogatory because followers were first called out by people that didn't agree with them. So many of them prefer to be called Salafis, which is in reference to Salaf, which was the first, second, and third generation of the people that lived at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Only three left, and at number three we have Quranism. And the word Quranism describes a branch of Islam where the Quran is accepted as a revelation from God, but the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, as well as the entire collection of the Hadith, are completely rejected. So those who share this belief are known as Quranists. And the doctrine that the Quranists follow states that the message in the Quran is clear and complete. So it can be understood without looking for external references like the Sunnah or the Hadith to clear up any sort of misunderstanding that may be in the Quran. Now, Islamic scholars actually condemn this belief and they point to the fact that the Quran commands Muslims to follow the example or the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And many scholars add that without the Hadith literature, many Islamic concepts would just be completely abstract and not have any real substance to them. For example, in the Hadith, you find how to pray and fast, as well as the obligatory giving, how to conduct that, and also how to make the pilgrimage to Mecca, which are all part of the five pillars of Islam. Madhavis come at number two. Madhavis believe in the oneness of Allah as well as the prophethood of Muhammad as the last messenger of Allah. And they also consider the Quran to be their holy book. Now they strictly follow the five pillars of Islam. They follow the Sunnah tradition and Sharia while having high respect and reverence for the house of the prophet Muhammad and his immediate offspring. Now, if you're not familiar with the term Madhavism, it's also known as Zikri in Pakistan, if you're familiar with that term. Well, anyways, it's a Muslim sect that was founded by Sayyid Muhammad Janpuri, who was born in India in the late 15th century. Now, Sayyid Muhammad declared himself to be the Imam Mehdi at the holy city of Mecca in front of the Kaaba in 1496 and is revered as such by the Madhavia community throughout the entire world. Now, Zikri Madhavis can be found predominantly in the Baluchistan province of Pakistan. And finally, at number one, we have the Nation of Islam. This was founded in Detroit in 1930 by Wallace Farg, who proclaimed a revelation for the African Americans that their salvation would come through self-knowledge by which they would recover a sense of their own history. Now, Elijah Muhammad was Fard's successor after Fard's mysterious disappearance back in the year 1934. 
Elijah Muhammad taught that Fard was an incarnation of Allah. And he commanded that other blacks who followed the movement were to withdraw from white society and create their own institutions, start up their own businesses. And now the traditional teachings of the Nation of Islam include the belief that humanity was originally black and that the white race was created by a black scientist named Yaqub who had rebelled against Allah. They also consider Christianity to be a danger because it's a religion of Western culture. Now, followers of the Nation of Islam, they stick to a strict lifestyle of praying five times a day. They abstain from alcohol, tobacco, as well as other drugs. They try to have a pure and simple diet as much as possible, among other practices. Now, the prominent members of the Nation of Islam include Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. And in this episode, I'm exploring the five major branches of Islam. The branch I'm going to start off with in this episode is the Sunnis. Sunni is the largest branch of Islam and it represents about 90% of all the followers of Islam worldwide. Sunni Islam is the largest religious denomination followed by Catholicism. And Sunnis regard their branch as the mainstream and traditionalist branch of Islam. Sunni followers believe that Muhammad had not appointed a specific successor. And many years after the death of the Prophet and a lot of debate, followers chose Abu Bakr to be the successor. Abu Bakr became the first openly declared Muslim outside of Muhammad's family. Abu Bakr had served as a very trusted advisor to the Prophet Muhammad. Now when we look a little bit closer inside what the Sunnis believe, well a lot of their beliefs really emphasize the views of their community at large. With the Sunnis instituting consensus, this allowed them to incorporate various different customs that came through historical development but don't necessarily have any base roots in the Quran. The Sunnis also recognize the six sound books of Hadith. And these books of Hadith contain spoken tradition that's attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. The Sunnis also accept the four schools of Islamic law. Okay, so now moving on to the next branch of Islam that I want to talk about. Shia. The Shia, sometimes written as Shiite, is a movement within Islam and it has very political origins. So after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in AD 632, the founders of the Shia movement, they wanted power to pass to the Prophet's son-in-law and cousin named Ali, and then to his male successors from there on out. And Shias believe that Muhammad personally chose Ali to be his successor. In the Shia faith, they also have Imams, and these are people that are more central figures as well as community leaders. Shias have a great influence in the contemporary world in Iran where nearly 90% of the Muslims are Shia Muslims. But Shia are also the majority in Iraq, Bahrain, and Yemen. Now I'm sure most of us have heard of the five pillars of Islam. Well, the five pillars of Islam, yes, they're shared between Shia and Sunni faiths. However, the five pillars are represented differently in Shia Islam. The five principal pillars of Shia are Tawheed, which is the oneness of God, Nubuwa, which is prophethood, resurrection, divine justice, and imama, which is a belief in the political and spiritual supremacy of the prophet's successors. The third branch of Islam now that I'm going to talk about is Ibadi. Ibadi is a school of Islam that's very dominant in the country of Oman. Although Ibadism is often described as very conservative, it is considered a tolerant sect of Islam and it emphasizes the rule of the just and rejects violence as a means to political ends. The Ibadi population is very small when you compare it to the Sunni and Shia Muslim population. There are roughly 2.72 million Ibadi in the world and most of them live in Oman. Oman is also the only country in the Muslim world that has an Ibadi majority as its population. Now the roots of Ibadism stem from the 7th century, about 20 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Ibadis can be traced back to the Karajites who came into existence during the first Islamic civil war back in 1656 to 1661. Karajites were the earliest Islamic sect and they emerged as a result of the religio-political controversy over the Caliphate. And the Caliphate is a political religious state comprising the Muslim community and the land as well as the people under its 
dominion in the centuries following the death of the Prophet Muhammad. And another thing that makes the Ibadis distinct from the other Muslim branches is that Ibadis believe that the Muslim community can govern themselves. They do not need any sort of religious central figure. And they're also distinct in that Ibadis do not believe that a Muslim leader needs to be a descendant of the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. Next up, I want to introduce Ahmadiyya. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is a very dynamic and it's also a fast-growing international movement within Islam. It was founded in 1889. The Ahmadiyya is the only Islamic organization to believe that the long-awaited Messiah has come in the person of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who was born in 1835 to 1908 in Qadian, India. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claimed that he was divinely appointed as both the promised Mahdi, which is the guided one, and Messiah expected by Muslims to appear towards the end times of the earth and bring about a very peaceful triumph of Islam all across the world. It's also believed that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed would embody the expected religious figure of major religions around the world. The Ahmadiyya believe that God sent Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, just like Jesus, to end religious wars, condemn violence and bloodshed, and reinstitute morality in the world, as well as justice and peace worldwide. So with that said, the followers of Ahmadiyya Islam do not believe that Muhammad is the final prophet. Now, the largest populations of Ahmadiyya Muslims are found in Indonesia, West and East Africa, as well as South Asia. As part of their efforts to really revive Islam, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, they continue to spread Ahmad's teachings of moderation and restraint and all of this in the face of opposition from other Muslim groups. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community also believes in the separation of mosque and state, so the difference between religion and politics. They want to keep that completely separate. Over a century ago, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he taught his followers to protect the sanctity of both religion and government by becoming righteous souls following your religious practices, as well as being loyal and faithful following the laws of the land, but never ever combine the two of them. Now the final group I'm talking about in this episode is Sufis. Sufism, known as Tasawwuf in the Arabic speaking world, is a form of mystical Islam and they really emphasize the beliefs and practices in which Muslims can seek and find a path to divine love and knowledge through direct personal experiences of God. The Sufi practice focuses a lot on the renunciation of material things, they focus a lot on the purification of the soul, and followers try to get closer to God by seeking spiritual learning known as tariqa. One of the most important rituals in Sufism is the zikr. During a zikr, one remembers God through meditation, chants, as well as a lot of body movement. Certain attributes and qualities of God are repeated by the person until they become saturated with God. Now this ritual is supposedly supposed to transform them and as they dance and move around for hours they reach a state of ecstasy in which they purify their heart where they are only conscious of the presence of God. This is a complete surrender and a complete emptiness to self. They believe that this experience of higher consciousness and being one with God does not have to wait until paradise. It can actually be achieved now, right here on earth as we know it. Turkey and Persia are actually considered to be centers of Sufism throughout the world, but Sufism has also reached Greece, Albania, and Macedonia, as well as other places. Starting with the sect at number 10, we have Sunni. 85% of Muslims are Sunni, and they consider themselves to be the guardians of Islamic tradition, as established by the Prophet Muhammad and the four rightly guided caliphs. Sources of religious and legal authority are the Quran and the Hadith, and then there's analogy or qiyas, as well as consensus, which is ijma. They are used to resolve problems not explicitly mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith, so those also play a very important role in the religion. Sunnis also believe that both individual as well as communities should be guided by Sharia law. And that brings us to our next sect, the Maliki. The Maliki school is one of the four major sects of Islam within Sunni Islam. Now it was founded by Malik in Anas in 8th century and the Maliki school of jurisprudence or school of thought relies on the Quran and the Hadith as its primary sources. Maliki also considers consensus of the people of Medina to be a valid source of Islamic law. Now it's also one of 
of the largest groups of Sunni Muslims. Number eight brings us to the sect of the Shafi'i. The Shafi'i sect is also one of the four schools of thought in Sunni Islam, one of the four main ones. And it was founded by the Arab scholar named Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. And he was a student of Malik in the early 9th century. Now this sect actually rejected provincial dependence on the traditional community practices as the source of legal ruling. And they argued for the unquestioning acceptance of the Hadith as the major basis for legal and religious judgments. Also the foundational text for the Shafi'i school of thought or sect is known as the Al-Risala, which means the message. And this was created by the founder of the sect, Al-Shafi'i. The sect at number seven is the Hanbali. Now the Hanbali sect is also another one of the four major Sunni schools of Islamic thought. Now it's named after the Iraqi scholar named Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And the belief system of the sect was then institutionalized by his students. The Hanbali sect is the smallest of the four major Sunni branches, by the way, and the scholars of the Hanbali school are also referred to as Al-Ihadith. The next sect I want to talk about in this episode is the Hanafi sect. This is considered to be the oldest and most liberal school of law, once again within the Sunni branch of Islam. The Hanafi sect was named after its founder, Imam Abu Hanifa, and it's a major school of Iraq Sunni Arabs. This sect uses reason or opinion in legal decisions. Also, the Hanafi sect, for the most part, is decentralized, and that made it very difficult for the 20th century rulers to incorporate its religious leaders into stronger, more centralized state systems. Continuing now to number five, here we talk about Shia. The Shia, also known as Shiites, they began as a political dispute over the leadership of Islam. Now, they considered Ali, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, as the first legitimate successor to the Prophet Muhammad. Now, Shiites also believe the revelation ended with Muhammad and the Quran. However, they also consider that there is to be a tradition of Imams who are granted powers to interpret the Sharia law as well as help govern the Muslim community. You've probably heard the term, even if you're not Muslim, Ayatollah. Well, that term means sign of Allah and it's a title used in Shia Islam. And the person with this title is considered to be someone so righteous that he can make independent judgments that carry the authority of the Imam. Shia Muslims are the ruling majority in modern Iran, as well as Shias are also found in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Pakistan, and Iraq. And of course, the find smaller groups in different parts of the world. Speaking of Shias though, we got to talk about the Twelvers. They come in at number four. Now, Twelver Shiism is the largest branch of Shia Muslims. It's also the majority sect in Iran where it is the state religion. And the very term Twelver actually, it refers to the belief in the 12 divinely ordained Imams. Now, these 12 men were to be descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. And for them, the 12 Imams carry great power. And this power not only allows them to rule over the Muslim community with justice, but also it qualifies them to interpret the not so clear meanings of the Quran. The Twelver Shiite sect fully accepts the oneness of God and the Quran, and they also acknowledge Muhammad as the final prophet. But also, like the general belief in Shia Islam, they consider the words and the deeds of the Imams as holding a lot of power, not just in their own immediate families, but also in the Muslim communities on a whole. The sect at number three is Ismaili. Now, the Ismailism is another branch or subsect of Shia Islam. The Ismailis also get their name from Imam Ismail ibn Jafar as the appointed Imam to Jafar al-Siddiq. So that's where the Ismailis differ from the Twelvers who accept Musa al-Kadhim, which was a younger brother of Ismail as the true Imam. Ismailism, it rose to a huge point actually to become one of the largest branches in Shia Islam. And it peaked as a political power within the Fatimid mid caliphate in the 10th all the way up until the 12th centuries. At number two, we have to talk about the Sufis. The word Sufis, not many people know, but it means woolen. And this actually refers to the coarse wool clothing that were worn by early Muslim mystics as a symbol of poverty and rejecting all the pleasures of the world. Sufis trace their origins back to the Prophet Muhammad as well as the Quran. And they teach that early Islam was a lot more concerned with the true spiritual matters as opposed to more materialistic matters as well as discussing strict laws and all of that. There was one professor of theology, Al-Ghazali, and at one point he sought to combine the legalistic as well as the mystical schools of Islam, and he prescribed Sufism as a remedy for spiritual problems in the world, not just in Islam, but in the 
the world in general. And finally, the last sect that we're going to look at in this episode is the Nation of Islam. Now, this sect was founded in Detroit in the United States in 1930 by Wallace Fard. Now, this was a man who said that he had a revelation from God for the African Americans, that their salvation would come through self-knowledge. And a lot of this knowledge was tied into African Americans just learning about their own history. A man by the name of Elijah Muhammad was Wallace Fard's successor after he mysteriously disappeared in 1934. Nobody knows where Wallace Fard went after that. But his followers, they maintain a strict lifestyle. They pray five times a day. They avoid intoxicants. They don't use any tobacco, no alcohol. They eat a pure diet, no haram foods, and they stay away from intimate relationships outside of marriage. Malcolm X, as well as Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace D. Muhammad, they made attempts to really bring the nation of Islam more in line with traditional Islam. But it still, for the most part, operates as its own sect or religion. Starting off with the term Sufi. So the original Sufis, right, they were simple wool cloaks. And in Arabic, the word Sufi means man of wool. So that coincides with you know, Sufis wearing the wool cloaks. It just kind of summarized the look that they had. When it comes to the term Sunni, so the name Sunni comes from the word Sunnah. And this refers to the behavior and the practices of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. When we go back and look at the history and the origins of Sufism and Sunni Islam, there are a lot of speculation and debate about how they actually originated. But the general view for Sufism, also known as Tasawwuf in the Arabic speaking world, well, this is a form of Islamic mysticism. And inside of Sufism, they really emphasize introspection as well as spiritual closeness with God. Now, while it's sometimes misunderstood to be a sect of Islam, the common belief is that it's actually a much wider style of worship that transcends being just a regular sect or branch of Islam. Imam Faisal, who is an Islamic cleric, says that Sufism is nothing more than the spiritual dimension of Islam. And now some scholars say that the earliest figures of Sufism are Muhammad himself, the Prophet Muhammad, and his companions. So it started off with Muhammad goes way back to that. Now, Sufi orders are based on the bayah or the Pledge of Allegiance. This refers to the Pledge of Allegiance that was given to the Prophet Muhammad by his companions. And that tradition continued throughout history where Sufis believe that if they do do this Pledge of Allegiance, they're totally in line with the practices that the Prophet Muhammad himself was okay with. When it comes to Sunni Muslims, Sunni Muslims, they regard their denomination or branch really as the mainstream and the traditionalist branch of Islam. So like the true form. Now there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is in fact true. And some say, no, all Islam is the exact same. It's just people develop different practices over time. But in any case, according to Sunni traditions, the Prophet Muhammad did not actually clearly designate a successor after his passing. So the Muslim community, well, they acted according to the Sunnah that elected his father-in-law, who was Abu Bakr, as the first caliph. And out of the 1.9 billion Muslims that live worldwide, about 1.5 billion Muslims follow this school of thought, which is Sunni Islam. So they by far make up the majority of the Muslim world. So for Sufism, the exact number of Sufis is not actually known. However, it is estimated that there are no more than 5% of the total Muslim population. And you can find Sufis predominantly in India, Pakistan, and Turkey, as well as Albania. But regardless, Islam is still a massive religion because Muslims by population, when you look at all the different regions, that Muslims make up. About 24.8% are in Asia, Oceania, 91.2% are located in the Middle East and North Africa, 29.6% are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and around 6% are located in Europe and 0.6% in the Americas. So when we look at the path to God in the schools of thought of Sufism and Sunni Islam, that's probably the fundamental difference between Sufism and Sunni Islam. 
That's the big question. What's the path that one has to go on to be fully united and one with God? Inside of Sunni Islam, Sunnis really put emphasis on following the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad through the Quran, as well as they have Sharia law and the Hadith. And this really sets out the guidelines that are strictly followed by Muslims in order to attain salvation and to be close to Allah. Among these practices are of course the five pillars of Islam, which are the Shahada. And this is sincerely reciting the Muslim profession of faith. The second pillar is the Salat. And this is really just performing rituals and prayers in the proper way. And this is done five times every single day. And then there's the Zakat, which is you know giving money to the poor and needy, or if you don't necessarily have any money, you're really helping them out with uh, services, good deeds, charity work, and all of that. The fourth pillar is the Psalm, which is fasting during the month of Ramadan. And the fifth final pillar is the pilgrimage to Mecca that Muslims must do at least once in their lifetime. So carrying out these obligations really provides a framework of Sunni Muslims to live by. And this really unifies their everyday activities and their beliefs into one religious devotional package, if you will. For Sufis, on the other hand, they give less emphasis, if anything at all, to the Hadith and Sharia, and they focus on the mystical and ritualistic practices of praising Allah. Followers of Sufism believe that just following Sharia very strictly isn't guaranteeing you any sort of union with God at all. They believe that more progressive forms of rituals and practices and meditations and things like that would actually bring a Muslim closer to Allah than just following some rules laid out in a book. They also do not believe that Sharia law should be the only legal system for Muslims. The ultimate goal of Sufis is Fana Fila, which is to actually lose oneself into the essence of Allah before actually physically passing away from earth. Now, there are four stages of Sufism that lead to Fana Fila. The first being the Sharia, so that's the external path. So yeah, of course, it's important for them to follow Sharia law. But then there's also the second stage, which is known as Tariqa, the internal path. Then the third is the Hakika, which is the mystical truth. And the fourth stage is the Marfat Gnosis, and that's the ultimate truth and reality. So you package Sharia with all the other three stages, and that's how you attain unity with Allah. Now, the main methods of attaining spiritual progress in Sufism are as follows. One must follow the guidance and instructions of an authorized sheikh or a guide. You must also perform the dikr, which is remembering the Lord through reciting his holy names as well as his attributes that glorify him and praise him as being the creator of all life. Then there's also gatherings where you can get advice from a sheikh or his representatives and that's where you sit together with others you pray together now when it comes to the Sunnis the Muslim doctrine is often summarized in six articles of faith now these are the fundamental beliefs which every Muslim must ascribe to the belief in one God then there is a belief in the existence of spiritual beings known as angels third is a belief in the revelations of God also the belief in the Prophet Muhammad as well as all of the prophets that were sent before him. Then the belief in the judgment and the resurrection. And the sixth and final is the divine decree, which is a belief in destiny.